There we go. It's just just the slide now without any window dressing or times and things like that. It looks good. You have to teach me. Okay. That. Amazing. Can anyone can anyone tell me where the beach is? No idea. Any any thoughts? It's like, this is Sobble Sob Beach. Oh. It's Sobble Beach, and you can take a guess as to what I was looking for and did not find. <laughs> the piping plovers? Piping plovers. We'll get into that as to uh, why I didn't find them. Uh, so, Angie, thanks for the introduction. Uh, thanks everyone for being here today. Um, as Angie mentioned, my name is Brett Forsyth. I'm a technologist and an educator. Uh, when I say technologist, I mean I do things as, as simple as web programming all the way to building uh, cat cameras for researchers. Uh, and I currently teach in a program called Environmental Visual Communication, which is a partnership between ROM and Fleming College, trying to create a bunch of people that are going to convince the rest of the world that science matters and that we should uh, save the planet. Uh, I'm a import to Ontario, so I moved out here in 2013. Um, my wife and my three kids and my two boys are there. Uh, we came here so that my wife could study organic agriculture, and little did I know that that meant that I was going to be a farmhand. Uh, and circumstances of my life allowed me to uh, make a transition at the time to focus more on photography. Um, I'd been doing it all the way well, for 20 years since slide film, uh, my true passion is, oh, well, one of my true passions is macro photography, um, but I do love photographing all the things, uh, including scientists and the uh, flora around, and this beaver was just down the road from my house on a slightly chilly winter morning. Um, but that's not birds, so how did I get into birds? Well, around the same time, I got my first telephoto lens. Uh, this was the spring of 2014. And this was the first time I'd ever experienced a Ontario spring migration. And in preparing for this presentation, uh, this image, going back to my archive, this was one of the first warblers I'd ever photographed. You know, the beautiful black throated green and, uh, Growing up in BC, I, I had never experienced a, a true spring migration like you do in Ontario. All the trees are too big and the land is too large. So I had never really paid attention to birds. And it really got me thinking. And the people I had met in Guelph were birders. And we started talking about birds and all the things that were coming up and really interesting. And in my conversations with my neighbor, who's an avid birder, um, I started to realize that things like a bald eagle, which is a crow back in BC, a dirt bird, you might say, um, people will get really excited about if you saw a bald eagle in Ontario, well, or in Guelph specifically. Um, and that it shocked me. I didn't understand what was going on. And what I started to realize was that um, a lot of our birds and a lot of the species in Ontario are at risk. Um, and then I started to try to focus on species at risk in my work. Um, that year, this happened as well, if anyone remembers this. This was the painted bunting that showed up in Oakville, uh, later to be confirmed as an escapee and not uh, a wild painted bunting. Um, but I was hooked. Like we chased this for a couple of days and it was minus 20 out and I'm out there freezing. And uh, I think this is where I really identified as a birder, um, not a lister, uh, still not a lister, I don't think, but uh, definitely an avid birder. And I spent the next, oh, I don't know. I'm still trying to document and photograph everything around, get the most beautiful shots and find every warbler and, and chase everything. Um, 
And is all of, I, I mean, you can throw it in the chat. Uh, how many people here, you know, you start, start down this road and then all of a sudden you're thinking about this. All right, you can show hands in the, in with the app or you can shout it out, but how many people are thinking about one of these? It, it just happens. And if you watch this movie, then, you know, it's, uh, it's an idyllic, sexy, adventurous time with no heartache and no troubles. <laughs> <laughs> um so you know the 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 movie the big year from 2011 um i think planted a seed in me i mean it it really is a great movie and it looks like a lot of fun and you know you're not looking at all their bank accounts so i had always i had always thought about doing a big year um this is a pretty knowledgeable group so i'm gonna try to go through these as quickly as i can uh please stop me if if it's not something you you know, but so a big year is just a personal challenge to try to count as many species as possible. Um, there's the different kinds of big years. You have worldwide big years, uh, country specific, state province, any self-defined area. Um, the really big ones, well, the most, one with the most cachet, I think in North America is the ABA big year, um, which is, uh canada u.s hawaii uh and the french islands of saint pierre uh saint pierre and martinique um but then there's also the continental aba which excludes hawaii um pretty easy to understand it starts january 1st goes to december 31st um you need to have you need to count the birds in the region that you're in um you can see or hear the birds. They must be alive. Um, subspecies and hybrids don't count and escapees don't count. So those are the general rules for a big year. And what really triggered me was in 2017 when Jeremy set the new Ontario record or the, the previous Ontario record. Um, it made the rounds in my social circle and it was like, oh, Somebody's actually doing it. This is really cool. Um, 345. Anyone who's into birds is like, that's kind of high, but you know, I could probably do that maybe one time. <laughs> um, once you start planning it, you realize that 345 species is bananas. <laughs> um, but a, a little bit of naivete in a big year is, is probably what you need. But something stuck out for me in his big year, and it was this. Um, he reported that he had done 90,000 kilometers in his car um, and a couple of helicopter rides up to Hudson Bay. And I couldn't, I was unable to wrap my head around that. I am, you know, working still full time, family, spending that much time in a car, and then the gas. So just the environmental impact of birding and and spending 90,000 kilometers worth of fuel in pursuit of birds. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't throw any shade on Jeremy or Kaya or any of the guys who have done this. Um, it just didn't work for me. I just don't, I could never see myself doing a traditional big year in a gas powered car, uh, which led me to start thinking about, uh, how to do it differently. And, and there is a movement uh, out there for big green years or big bees. Um, and Jen Bach was the one who actually introduced me to this. And the rules here is that, that it's the same as a big year, but you're just trying to limit your footprint. And there was a very loose set of definitions for this. Lots of people do big bees using public transit or carpooling or electric vehicles, and that's fair to them. There's a slightly more, um, I, I count myself in this group, so slightly more insane group of folks that think that you should do it under your own power. <laughs> um, so that is where I went. But I, I really wanted to clarify this. I wanted to put a stake in the ground. 
So for me, uh, I wanted to create, I wanted to do a human powered big year. And, and that meant that all birding had to start and finish from my, my home under my own power. Um, I was going to follow the eBird listing rules. So um, count it from where you, you see it. Um, and I wasn't trying to do this self-supported. If people were going to a place and they wanted to carry my 35 pounds of gear home with them, um, then that's great. But I wasn't, I didn't want anyone to do a special trip just at my, my behest. Uh, the other rule here is that if I went and saw a bunch of birds and I got COVID, I would allow myself to get picked up from where I was sick. And then I would have to ride back to where I was sick and then ride home to count those birds. Um, and then, uh, you know, the ego is involved in all of this. So, uh, I don't know of an Ontario record or one before I said it, I'm saying said it because I don't know of one. Um, so, you know, I wanted to be a little bit famous in terms of setting a new stake in the ground and hopefully inspire some of the younger birders out there to take this up and, and try to do more birding in a, in a green way. Uh, having said that, my plan was to try to get 300 species. Um, <laughs> I naively thought I was going to get video of every species. And if you've ever tried to get video of a warbler, you know how that went. Um, I was hoping to do a bunch of video interviews of birders along the way. Uh, I, I made it to 13 weeks of doing uh, weekly video updates. Um, and then I went to Point Pelee and it all went bananas. Um, I, the only thing I really knew was that I wanted to go to Point Pelee and I wanted to go to Rainy River. Um, and we'll talk about why I didn't go in a second um, and just chase as much as possible. So this is where I live. I live in Guelph. Um, and this is uh, the distances away from my home. And this is one of the reasons why I even considered doing a Big B was that uh, within 100 kilometers of where I live, I have access to some of the best birding hotspots in Ontario, which meant that uh, if something interesting showed up a uh, hundred kilometers, uh, actually it turns out about 320 kilometers is my limit for a day trip. Um, so I thought I, I had a good chance of set it, uh, getting to 300 with this kind of a, a radius around where I live. Um, so everyone who's birds in the spring knows that you're gonna end up having to be along the Lake Erie shoreline, uh, probably visiting Long Point, Rondo and Peely. Um, and then anyone who's ever considered doing a big year knows that you have to go to Rainy River in around June to get some of the like Western species to really push yourself over the top. Um, I don't have the distance on here, but Rainy River from my house is 1600 kilometers. Um, and I was convinced in 2021 that I was going to ride to Rainy River and ride home. So that's 10 days there at 160 kilometers a day. So hundred miles a day for 10 days, just to get there, spend a week there and then 10 days home. So, that was that was the physical limit and i knew that that was going to require a lot of training so in 2021 i rode about 9000 kilometers i simulated a trip to rainy river i did i did seven rides 100 kilometers plus in 10 days just to see what would happen to my body i started doing some like longer solo rides i did a 200 kilometer one uh it's started doing some winter training definitely didn't do enough of that and then uh, anyone who's done any long distance cycling knows that you have to learn how to eat on the bike and what works. And um, I never wanted to answer the question that my son asked me, which was, what happens when you have to go poop on the bike, dad? <laughs> um, so 20, 2021 was, was training. Uh, I had some bikes already. So I had a road bike and a mountain bike. Uh, those were the two uh, that I started with and I finished with a gravel bike. And if anyone's considering doing a human powered big ear, you really only need the bike in the bottom uh, right-hand corner. Um, 
it's it's sort of the ideal bike to do something like this. Um, and because I was going to do video, of course, I'm going to carry 15 pounds of gear everywhere all the time. <laughs> so I, I have a large SLR and a 400 millimeter lens and teleconverters and tripods and a GoPro. So that's that was about the extent of the planning that I had going into this. So if any of you are like, oh, it's too much planning and I'm not experienced enough. I, I love to tell people that I'm I'm not a great birder because I'm really not. I'm better now. This was sort of a forcing function this big year. Um, but you just have to want an adventure. You want to want to get better and you want to get going. So enough of me talking about boring stuff. All of you really want to see birds. So let's let's get this started. So leading up to the big year, uh, Guelph had a, a, a local celebrity bird. And on January 1st, uh, I was hell bent on going and finding it. And lucky for me, it spent 10 days or more in Guelph. And this mountain bluebird was how I kicked off the year. So first rarity, super amazing. Um, super pumped until I got home and saw this email. <laughs> um, if you know Southern Ontario, Hamilton from Guelph is about, and in this case, it was in 50 point conservation area. It's 65 kilometers. Um, the forecast was for minus 16. Um, and a round trip, it's 130 K. Uh, and it, the days are really short. So I got up first thing in the morning and rode down to 50 point and minus 16 to have my first major dip of the year. So I did not see a boreal owl, but instead I got sawwood owl and long-eared owl. So I was, uh, I was pretty happy um, because of how far and how long I had. I had 60 minutes in 50 point before I had to start riding home before it would get dark before I got home. But uh, if I hadn't seen these two owls, uh, it would have been a miserable ride back in uh, pretty chilly conditions. And there was no rest because a few days, a few days later, another Western rarity came by, another code five bird, uh, if you know your rarity codes, which is this golden crown sparrow. Um, I have to give a, a big thank you to George for inviting so many people to his home and, and showing them around. Um, put me on the bird right away and I, you know, it's 82 kilometers, but it was, it was fast. Um, January doesn't slow down though, because uh, it's owl season and there's always owls up near Metz and specifically snowy owls. Um, the only problem is Metz is 50 kilometers from my house. <laughs> um, it was minus 10 on this day. Uh, if you know anything about electronics in the cold, everything, everything died eventually. So I was about 20 kilometers away from home and my phone died and I thought I was going to get frostbite on my feet. Um, I was hoping for Lapland long spur and rough legged hawk on this trip, but uh, I did not get either of those. Um, but a snowy owl and some snow buntings, I was I was pretty happy. Um, but this is this is what I was dealing with when I was out there. Uh, so you can see how deep the snow is on on the mountain bike, and, and those boots were the thing that I bought the next day because uh, I did not want to lose my my toes. Um, and inside those boots, I put heated socks. <laughs> if you've, if you've never had the luxury of using battery powered heated socks before, you are missing out on the finer points in life, um, because they are a miracle and they came in super happy or super handy for the next big chase, which was this Harris's Sparrow in Hamilton or just outside of Hamilton. Uh, I went twice before I saw it. 
Um, and both times I waited about two hours in about minus eight uh, before I finally got to see the Harris the Sparrow. So, so far I'm doing all right. Uh, we're into February now. Things are, are things are starting to uh, warm up a little bit. Um, and before the winter ended, uh, something that I thought was impossible happened. Um, some birds are just, they take two trips. And it's a theme that happened a couple of times throughout the year. And it's because the boreal owl showed up at 50 point again. So on March 5th, I did another 140 kilometers and managed to, to see the boreal owl. Um, unfortunately, this, this owl ended up uh, getting harassed pretty, not, People weren't being very respectful and it had to get roped off, uh, which is a which is a shame because it was putting on a show and you did not have to get up close to it to to get interesting photos. So and then uh, sometimes you don't have to work as hard for for relatively rare birds because a greater white fronted goose showed up in Guelph, which is uncommon. Um, and at this point, people sort of knew what kind of crazy I was up to. So I actually got put on this bird by a local birder here who sent me a, a Facebook message and said, hey, Brett, is this a greater white front of goose? <laughs> and I was like, heck, yes, it is. And where is it? And it was, you know, it was only about 20K from the house just in downtown Guelph. It was probably one of the easiest, relatively hard birds to get. And that, that wrapped up my winter. So it, I ended up doing um, almost 1,400 kilometers in the winter. And I got three Code 5 rarities. Uh, those are the ones in green. Um, biggest regrets was I didn't make it down to Niagara for at least the latter part of winter for gulls and things like that. Um, told myself, no, no worries, you can do it again in the, the other winter. Um, and I didn't spend enough time on the Lake Ontario waterfront that, that was, those are my two big regrets from the first winter was I didn't spend enough time doing waterfowl and getting to Niagara at least once. And that leads us into spring. Um, anyone know what this is before I play the audio? So spring was was amazing. So April April sixth shows up, and uh, this is right out my bedroom window. <laughs> so the the only bummer about that barred owl was that it woke me up at uh, like one in the morning but from then I went and did the video um, the same day I had plans to go and see a willet in Hamilton and the that would be fine because going to Hamilton the lift bridge is not that far you see it's 150k on the day because not only was there a willet around but there was also a western grebe <laughs> Uh, the Western Grebe was pretty tricky, so I got the Willet pretty early. It was just hanging out at the lift bridge. But I ended up having to go over to Port Credit for the Western Grebe. And when I got there, I ran into a few birders, and they're like, oh, it hasn't been seen in a while. Um, and specifically, I ran into C. Price, and we split up. He went one way, I went the other. And uh, we met back up right at the mouth of the port, and we're like, oh, I didn't see it. I didn't see it either. I was happy I had the willet um, and we were commiserating about not finding the, the Western Grebe and I'm looking at the water and he's looking at me and it pops up basically between his legs. Um, so that was a, a huge bonus. Very windy, very cold still on April 6th and uh, Steve left and I fixed a flat and, I, and then I went home. Um, 
at this point, I started to think about uh, more of the spring warblers coming through and not putting myself in a position where I couldn't chase things. Um, and then my first panic attack happened, which is uh, I get noticed that there's a, a major rarity right in Guelph. Um, and I had just left to do groceries with my wife. And I said, can we go home so that I can chase this bird? And I got that knowing look of like, we're not going home right now. <laughs> um, so my uh, my anxiety ran high because this yellow throated warbler was within five kilometers of my house. Um, so we we rushed through the groceries and I ran home and I rode as hard as I possibly could. I almost threw up when I got to the park. Um, and I managed to hang around longer than most other people to refine this yellow throated warbler. Uh, you'll notice the date, April 16th. Um, I'm starting to think about the big trip I'm going to Pili and my first major disaster of the year happens. Um, I break my telephoto lens um, and my emotions were all the things. Um, luckily I have uh, a type of insurance and uh, Canon hooked me up with a lens. So I was able to keep uh, I can get you the, uh, Jeff, I can get you the brand of heating socks. Um, they are absolutely amazing. Um, so the only issue with this lens was that it's it costs $10,000 and comes in a aluminum suitcase. <laughs> um, so I wasn't super pumped about taking that to Peely, but they ended up getting me something else. But it did allow me to just keep shooting and finding some rarities close to home uh, so I could keep keep tallying up things. So we're at the point now where it's time to start planning for Peely. Um, this is all of the gear that I took to Peely. Uh, it's uh, it's a bit of stuff. <laughs> so this, I took all of this on the bike. Uh, this is, I started to invest in the lightest camping gear that I could possibly find, um, but it still ends up looking like a lot of stuff. I think it ended up weighing... 30 some odd pounds or something like that. Uh, so the big trip is uh, Long Point, Rondo and Peely. Uh, Long Point from my house is 150 some odd kilometers. Um, Long Point to Rondo is about 150 kilometers. And then uh, Rondo to Peely. Well, I ended up staying at Wheatley with some friends who saved my butt because I didn't plan very well and I had nowhere to stay and I was going to hard camp on the shoulders in Peely. <laughs> um, so Rondo to, to Wheatley is about 70 kilometers. So in those two days, I did about 370 kilometers just to get to Peely. Um, and when you do that, you end up looking like this. Uh, and Stu McKenzie saved my bacon at Long Point. I got to stay in his little uh, tent trailer, which was amazing because uh, I had never ridden with that much gear on my bike before. And I seem to have developed a blister in some place that I won't show you. <laughs> uh, so I was, I was feeling a little rough. Um, and when I got to Long Point, it was very cold. And the only, the only bird that was like sort of unexpected was the solitary sandpiper. And I had made the choice, if you guys remember, uh, there was a, a mega in Ontario, which was the Marsh Sandpiper. I decided not to go to the Marsh Sandpiper because um, the wind from the Marsh Sandpiper to Rondo was going to be too dangerous. Um, if I had known I wasn't going to pick up much in Long Point, I might have risked it. Um, but it was probably the best idea because... Another 150k. Um, you can hear the wind. It was a tailwind the whole way. It was probably the fastest I could have ever done 150k. Um, and I managed to get to Rondo, set up my tent, met some great people along the way. If you ever get a chance to go to per Port Burwell, you got to go to Beach Patties and meet Lisa and John because they're the friendliest folks ever. Um, 
It's also the ride where the only ride where I got chased by a giant monster dog. Um, and things were looking up at this point because reports started to come in about a mouse bird. Does anyone know what kind of bird I'm talking about? What what bird is more mouse than bird? The Henslow Sparrow. So this, this Henslow has put it on a show for about four days. And, and you could you could lie down in the grass and it would come within three feet of you or closer. Uh, it had, was not fussed at all. Um, this was one of the lifers I'd been chasing for years. And man, you can't ask for a better experience than this. So you'd think I'd be over the moon at this point, having a Henslow's and getting such amazing footage and stuff, but I'm getting greedy at this point <laughs> because there's all sorts of reports coming in. Uh, if you know the area, Shrewsbury has a celebrity bird, which is, which is this. So I got up at six in the morning and hit the road, hit the Long Point Causeway into a headwind. And there's this little guy here, which is, Eurasian collar dove. And, and what makes this guy so tricky is that the yard that it's in, the person raises pigeons. So you're trying to listen for the collar dove over top of all the other pigeons. And it just gets really tricky. So I, I was here for half an hour waiting and I could hear it, but I couldn't find it for the longest time. And it was just on the grass right in front of me. Um, still super greedy because that day there was also this fellow. white-faced ibis hanging out in Erio. So I, I was feeling over the moon. I managed to get to Wheatley after getting Henslow Sparrow, Eurasian Colored Dove, and a white-faced ibis, all within the span of 24 hours. And I pulled into Wheatley, met up with my friends. And for those of you that don't know Mike Cadman, Mike Cadman is an exceptional birder. And here's here's the lessons about doing a human power big year with Mike Cadman, which is if you're going to go anywhere with Mike Cadman, ride your bike, because Mike's going to find really cool stuff <laughs> and you won't be able to count it because you didn't ride your bike. Uh, so we went to Hillman Marsh that night and he he's like, oh, that's a snowy egret. And it was like way off in the distance. And I don't know how like, I would never have been able to call it from that distance. He's like, oh yeah, look, there's the yellow feet. And everyone got it in the scope. And I was very, very sad. Um, but like all good birds, I got a second chance. So uh, the next day, uh, if if you know anything about Point Pelee, is that it has the, the world's worst cell phone reception. Um, so I had birded the day, birded the park for most of the day. And I came out to get lunch and then head back to camp. And my phone messages went crazy um, with, hey, Brett, the snowy egret is at Hillman again. Um, and I was 20 kilometers away and all the messages were about 10 minutes old. Um, so I got my food to go. So I had to wait another five minutes and then I pedaled again, another, um, you're gonna throw up when you get there. And I got my second chance. And I showed up and I kid you not, this is all of the footage I got. And that is literally all the time I had with the bird. Uh, there, I'm not, I wasn't there looking at it through the binoculars for very long. That, that was it. it I showed up and then it flew. Um, everyone else was pretty chuffed. And I was pretty dead. <laughs> and everyone's like, you know, there's ticks in the grass, right? And I'm like, I don't care. I can't even breathe properly um and everyone was laughing at me uh if i showed you all of my peely photos we'd be here all night so i'm going to do what i lovingly call the Healy, uh, the peely hit parade um normally i get you to call these out but we're just going to go through them uh real quick you can type it in the the chat let's see who can get all of them Jeff, you should be able to get all of these. Half of them you called out on the tip.
What I didn't realize at the time was I had an exceptional Peely birding year. I went this year and it was slow. I would have been very afraid for my chances on the big year this year, but everything was there. Pretty much found every warbler. Like it was bananas. It was so good. Um, just so many good things. Like, just everything. Everything I wanted for and more. And we'll talk about more in a second. Uh, funny story about this uh, least bittern is uh, the night before Jeremy Ben said actually rolled up. I was riding back to Wheatley and he he came up beside me in his car and he's like, hey, do you have least bittern yet? <laughs> I'm like, no, I don't have least bittern yet. And he took me to a spot where we, we spent 20 minutes listening to one call. We never found it, but uh, big shout out to Jeremy and all the help he gave over the years too. Yeah, good job, Jeff. That was. Uh, and has anyone ever seen an an orange, an orange face scarlet tanager? Like this is a. A very, very beautiful coloring for for scarlet tanager. It blew my mind. It was the first one I'd ever seen. Uh, and then Peely is always good for a good circus or two. Um, and the year that I was there. It was not the bird of the century. It was not uh, it was not the will of time again, but it was pretty close um, because it drew this kind of a crowd. <laughs> um, and I it was a, a group of Dutch birders who found it. Uh, and I I would never have been able to call this. Uh, Jeff, you probably can, but I don't know how many of you can can tell me what this is. This is the kind of looks it was giving. It wasn't it wasn't amazing looks. So this was the Bell's Vireo, which was uh, I think the bird of the year that year. And uh, myself and a bunch of the other big year birders, we we booked it to this spot uh to get this one. Um and that was Peely. Peely was amazing. I left there, I think I got a hundred I added about a hundred and 25 species i think in peely in the peely area uh, but it, i wasn't done so on the way home uh Irio provided me with an eared grebe um which was amazing uh and i missed it on the first night i was in rondo but got it on the second night and uh i think this is probably one of my favorite bird calls of all time So Rondo has, you know, a lot of whippoorwill and all it took was getting up late, walking down the street and listening a little bit. It was just beautiful. And that night, actually, I had a great horned owl as well. Um, I had already had that at home, but uh, just a beautiful way to end the trip to Peely. Uh, I didn't rest very long, though. For, for work, we ended up doing, uh, we took a bunch of the students to the Huron Fringe Burning Festival um normally i'm uh, i teach and and do some things but i just decided to go and be tired the whole time um because here on fringe is close to sobble beach which would get me piping plover and then you know i could get uh upland sandpiper and wilson snipe wilson snipe doing funny things uh maybe a couple of the other warblers that i'd missed but it Peely provided. So I got the snipe. I did find Upland Sandpiper, but the uh, unless you re are really into bird butts, uh, I'm not going to show you a photo. Um, I did get this lovely, lovely blackbird. Um, does everyone know what that one is? So it's a brewer's blackbird. And when people tell you about brewer's blackbird, they're like, they're really shiny. <laughs> and you're like, well, 
every blackbird's kind of shiny. And then you finally see a brewer's blackbird and you're like, oh, that's what they mean. Because they are the shiniest of the shiny, shiny birds. They, it really, the second you see it, you know, it's, a, it's an instantaneous thing. It's like, oh, okay, that's a brewer's blackbird. Um, but I got skunked. I did not see the piping plovers at Sauble Beach. So in 2021, the piping plovers did not breed at Sauble Beach. And then the impossible happened. Uh, I saw this bird in Peely for what I think amounted to 500 milliseconds. Um, and then I got treated to this locally. So a couple of local birders found a yellow breasted chat on territory within 15k of my house and boy did he put on a show um another bird that i've been chasing for a really really long time because it's another one of ontario's species at risk um i never imagined that i would get a singing uh yellow-breasted chat so close to home uh so this is june um we're coming into full breeding season and I don't know if anyone remembers the first successful breeding of this species was 2021 and it just so happened that um, it was in Strathroy which is 150 kilometers from my house and I didn't have enough time to do it as a two-day trip so I decided that I was going to ride my bike to Strathroy to get black neck stilts in one shot. This is the longest bike ride I've ever done. It was 12 hours in the saddle. Um, it was the easiest ride I had done all year. Uh, and I didn't realize it at the time, but in photographing them, I actually captured them swapping on the nest. Uh, this will loop, so you'll see it again, but there's two birds here. So this one flies in, the other one pops up, scoots onto the nest, and then walks away like nothing happened. So this was the first successful breeding of black neck stilts in Ontario, and then they did it again this year, and there was another nest in another location this year as well. So maybe we're going to start having more black neck stilts. And that's summer. So I rode almost 3,500 kilometers. I added eight rarities. Um, I was pretty happy. Uh, now, I knew that this was spring migration and that this was the, the golden times. This was the good, good times when everything was smiles and gr grins and you get easy birds. Uh, I knew summer was going to be harder, but I didn't really know that summer was going to be almost depressing. <laughs> I did know that it was going to be this, which was chase all of the things. Um, I had a score to settle with piping plover, so I went to Wasaga Beach, um, where they had multiple nests in the Wasaga Beach area. And I got up there for a beautiful set of little hatchlings. Um, and 2021 was the first year that people were announcing uh, something kind of special, which was the Kirtland Warblers in uh, just outside of Barrie. Uh, I can't remember. My brain's failing me on the exact Packard track. So I, I rode 150 kilometers and got the piping plovers. I spent the night at a friend's house. And then in the morning, I rode to Packard Track, which wasn't very far uh, to get Kirtland's Warbler. This was my, by far, my biggest blunder of the year, which was the bird. I was standing next to the gentleman who photographed this. Uh, I raised my camera to take a photo and nothing happened. And it flew away. And I realized my camera was off. <laughs> um, so I, I still have to get 
a Kirtland Warbler photograph uh, for myself. Uh, it was pretty dead. Like I was adding things, um, but the next major thing that happened was a, a little blue heron showed up uh, sort of close by. Um, and I chased it all over the place. It was at a conservation area and then it had flown and then I went to go check another marsh and then it came back. So I ended up doing one another one of the like, can Brett ride us fast enough to find the bird before it flies away? Uh, and just like the, the snowy egret, I didn't have very much time with this. I only got a couple shots. This one's okay, um, but I did manage to see it. Uh, for anyone that knows Hamilton, occasionally you get, um, there's a pelican that'll hang out in the bay for a little while. I had three aborted attempts on pelicans uh, before this day. Uh, it was quite foggy and I owe Rowan this one. He was standing on the high level bridge with his scope and they had been looking for, I don't know, half an hour maybe and hadn't seen it. And then right as we were all about to leave, he's like, oh, there it is. And I looked through his scope and I'm like, I don't know how you found that. It was, it was ridiculously tiny, super far away. He had to leave and I was like, well, I'm going to go and see if I can get a closer look. And I'm sure glad I did because this beautiful pelican was right in close to shore and offered me these wonderful views. Uh, so all good birds require more than one trip. And then I got a, within a, a day of that, I got a message, which is, you can't tell anyone what this is and where it is, but uh, you need to go here and find this. Does anyone know what that is? It's a king rail. And it was hanging out at a marsh very close to my home. Um, it killed me not to let other people know that it was there because I know so many people would want to see it. It was at a private property, so I had to respect that. Um, but I, I put this in here because I couldn't have done the big year without the community of people that were supporting me along the way. And a lot of these birds, I didn't find myself. A lot of them I was put onto by more knowledgeable people who are just excited about birding and want to help people along the way and, and show them really cool stuff. Um, so I, I had one of the best days chasing those black neck stills, but let me tell you about the worst day I had. Um, it, it's a cool bird. Uh, if you can spot it in here. Which cormorant doesn't look like the other cormorants? So it's a little bit smaller. It's got a white bee or a white uh, part on its mouth. So this ne neotropic cormorant was in Toronto. So I left early. I double flatted my bike. Um, I only had one spare inner tube. So I walked 5k to a bike shop where I bought more inner tubes. The owner wouldn't let me use his bike pump. I got back on the road. I got to Toronto. Uh, I couldn't find the cormorant. Uh, they all got flushed by a boat at one point. Um, so I was sitting there texting all of my bird helpers. Is this it? Is this it? Is this it? And then I finally saw it. I, and then I'm like, I'm pretty sure this one's it. They're like, yes, that's it. I was super tired at this point. I left. I went on the Queen's Way. I got hit by a car. Um, I was fine. But I saw Neotropic Cormorant. So I wasn't about to phone anyone to come pick me up. <laughs> So I straightened my handlebars and I, I started riding home. Uh, my phone died in Mississauga, which I use as my maps. So I don't know Mississauga very well. So I got lost in Mississauga. Uh, my legs started to cramp. 
and I ran out of water on the way home. And it was 175 kilometers all told because I lost my way. <laughs> so that was, this was the worst bird of the entire year. Uh, and Toronto, Toronto provided some amazing birds and, and some heartbreak as well. So uh, my biggest nemesis for the year that I actually found was uh, this. So this is the juvenile uh, yellow crown night heron that was in Colonel Sam Smith Park. Uh, the day that I saw it, it was 157 kilometers. Um, Marcus, who's doing a big year in Hamilton this year, stayed to show me. I probably wouldn't have been able to find it myself because I'm not very good at birding. Um, and this was my third attempt at yellow crown night heron because an adult had been seen in Hamilton and I chased that twice and those trips were uh, 100 kilometers a piece. So this was the most kilometers I put into a bird that I found. Um, again, people were helping me out, uh, but sometimes you don't want the help because you get texts of things like, hey, do you have Hudsonian Godwit? And I'm like, no. Why would I have Hudsonian Godwit? Oh, I'm on one right now in Luther Marsh. <laughs> and Luther Marsh is 65 kilometers from my house. And I'm like, can you see it from the, the road? And the answer was no. And I said, well, how am I going to see it? And the person who was there, Dan McNeil, he's like, well, I have my kayak and I'll wait for you. I'm like, it's going to take me two hours to ride there. So he waited for me. I used his kayak. And I kayaked across to the island in the background for three kilometers after 65 kilometers and two hours of riding to get the Hudsonian Godwit. Now, Hudsonian Godwits are amazing, and I would have done it no matter what, but what I didn't know is that 10 days later, a Hudsonian Godwit would show up within five kilometers of my house at Guelph Lake and stay there for 10 days. <laughs> um, so all good birds require two trips, I guess. Uh, and this is what happens in the summer. So I only added 22 species in the summer. Now, you can see there's a lot of green in there. So I added seven new rarities, but for 2,300 kilometers, that's that's 100 kilometers a bird, essentially. Um, and we're coming into the winter. At this point, I'm, I'm pretty spent. My body's starting to feel pretty beat up and I still have a whole bunch of birds to get still, uh, which leads us into the autumn and winter. Now, again, I was, I was feeling um, pretty beat up and I knew that I might have to go to Hot Cliff, which is down by Long Point, but I didn't fancy a freezing night in a tent after 100 kilometers of riding. So I just started birding my yard um, in my local area to get raptors. So I got kestrels and broadwing hawks and there's always a peregrine that kind of hangs out close by and we get, uh, I'm pretty sure this is a, a sharp shin hawk. Jeff, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, oh, and that's not a, actually, sorry, that's a uh, a red-shouldered hawk, peregrine, sharpie, broadwing, and red tail. And the reason why I was going to have to go to Hawk Cliff was the next bird, which I had zero hope of ever seeing close by. Um, and I was out helping my wife on the farm, and I saw this on the horizon, and I'm like, and at this point, Mind you, I have the camera in the yard at all times when I'm outside, um, and I see this coming over the horizon. And I get a golden eagle flying over my house in Guelph. And I was like, "Thank you. I don't have to go to Hot Cliff now. Not that I don't. I'm not that I have a problem with Hot Cliff, but I just didn't <laughs> didn't have it in me. Um, so I had this beautiful golden eagle fly right over the house, uh, and I was so happy." Now, Tommy Thompson Park, I have a love-hate relationship with Tommy Thompson Park. It's really, really far away from my house. And I had already chased Harlequin Duck there once this in the year to no success. Um, and I needed to go because there was Lapland Longspurs there, Tundra Swans, and Black Scoter, and 
cackling goose were all possible. Uh, at this point, I chased cackling goose a number of times, and I figured they didn't exist. Um, and the reason is, is you scan every flock of Canada geese and look for cackling geese, and they're never there. And I knew this one spot had cackling geese in the last week, and I was scanning and scanning. I was looking at every flock. You get sick of looking at every Canada goose, um, but there's actually three in here. Um, and I'm just going to zoom in on one. And I had spent ages annoying all of my friends saying, is this a cackling goose? Is this a cackling goose? They're like, no, you'll know because the beak is really short. And then you finally see one and you're like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm stupid for sending you all these lesser Canada geese. <laughs> um, but up until this day, I, I swore that cackling geese was just a prank that people were playing on me. Um, and Tommy Thompson Park didn't disappoint. It, it gave up something that I did not expect. I did get black scoter. I didn't get great photos, but I got this. I thought I was going to have to go to Perskeel for this. Um, we were just hanging out. I was birding with some friends and people were like, oh, did you did you hear about the purple sandpiper over on Pen A or Pen B or wherever it was? I was like, no. <laughs> so we, my friend and I rushed over and sure enough, there's purple sandpiper just hanging out beating along the shoreline, giving us great views. Um, super amazing. This also happened to be uh, when everyone else was preparing for cave swallows because the winds were going to be great. And I tried the next day to rip over to 50 point to get cave swallows. But I was halfway there when the reports came in that they flew over. Um, and by the time I got to uh, Hamilton or Burlington, uh, they were nowhere to be found. So I miss cave swallows, but I got purple sandpiper. And the right after this, uh, on November 10th, I was finishing teaching for the year. And I was about to head up to Barrie to get Pacific Loon and to go to Algonquin Park to get all of its fun birds. And I finally got sick. Um, this was the... The only time I got sick in 2021, and it took me out for 10 days. It wasn't COVID, but I was unable to ride. Um, I was birding locally a little bit, but I, it was pretty bad. Uh, some was around a bunch of little kids, and I just got some sort of head cold finally, and even masking. Uh, up until this point, I thought 280 birds was going to be possible. I'd given up hope on 300, but 280 seemed possible. Um, but after this, uh, 275 was my new target. I figured 275 was still possible. Um, Algonquin was out of reach now. Algonquin as a trip would have been three days ride to get there, three days home in foul weather. And then you'd only have maybe a day or two to bird Algonquin, which isn't really enough. Um, but some things started to align in, in Niagara, which was um, another nemesis bird that requires two trips is uh, people found some Harlequin ducks. They were hanging out at Port Weller. Um, and if you've ever been to Port Weller, there's a long spit and it drops off into the lake. And I showed up and there was a couple other birders there. And I'm like, are they still here? And they're like, they're right here. And they were feeding within three feet of the breakwater. So I'd chase Harlequin duck multiple times throughout the year. Um, and I never imagined I was going to get them this late. And I got two young males just feeding right near the breakwater. And the day that I left, uh, a bunch of people spotted um, razorbills in the mouth of the Niagara River. And this is where I spent two very cold days. This is my friend tree that would protect me from the wind as I scanned the mouth of the river for very, very tiny <laughs> razorbills, which I did not see. Um, and... I was very tired because this was the first big ride I had done. Niagara actually is only 120k from my house, so that's not too bad. But I got black vulture, little gull, blackest gull, and the harlequin ducks 
in Niagara. So I, it was, it was definitely worth the trip. Um, I was definitely beat. Um, and I was so very close to 275 at this point. If I'd added, um, if I'd added razor bills that i I would have I would have gotten to 275, but they they showed up two days after I left. Um, we're getting down to the last little bits of it. Um, Bohemian wax wings. Uh, for anyone who knows Dan McNeil, he he works around Luther Marsh, um, and. He's always reporting Bohemians and all sorts of fun stuff from the Luther Marsh area. Um, and he, again, was the, the agent of my demise because he found them again. And he he texted me. He's like, there's Bohemian wax wings at this pin right now. Um, so I got on my bike again for another 113 kilometer bike ride. And... I was on a side road where I could see the wax wings. I knew they were wax wings, but I didn't feel comfortable calling them Bohemian wax wings. And he didn't have a scope and my camera wasn't giving me the resolution from the side road. So I decided to hike through knee deep snow for a kilometer and a half to get close enough to get this terrible photo of Bohemian wax wings so that I could add them. And if, if you're looking at the date here, we're we're down to it now. So this is December 20th. This is species number 273, I believe. So I'm two away from my goal at this point. Um, this is a long day. It was minus five. It wasn't it wasn't the worst, but it wasn't the best. Um, getting Bohemian wax wings definitely makes it easier to ride home. Um, and now I want to share with you my final bird for the year. Uh, I don't know if Dean's in on this. Um, Dean and Mike were doing surveys up near uh, Luther again. And I, I I knew that this bird frequented the, the Mets area and, and Luther Marsh. Um, and that's why I was so keen on riding there all the time, because I figured I would have picked it up by now. And I, I didn't see one. And every time I'd ever been up to the those areas, I'd always see at least one. Um, but I I hadn't this year. Um, so Dean, Dean and uh, Mike found one and they said, OK, here it is. But I got it too late in the day to go that day. So I had to wait till the next day and just go scour the area again. Um, and this was my final bird. Ooh, emotional. Didn't think I was gonna get this one. Anyways, time to go home. So rough-legged hawk was how I ended it off. Uh, I tried to get to 275. I spent all of December 31st. I spent the entire day hiking all of my local area looking for red poles. <laughs> um, because that would have put me at 275. And the one red one red pole I saw was a bird butt that my friend called out that I don't feel comfortable counting. So I ended up with 274 species, uh, 355 hours of riding, over 9,000 kilometers. Um, and the firm belief that everyone should be doing this. Everyone should be birding under their own power more. Um, and the firm belief that if anyone wants to try to break this record, I will help you 100%. I will tell you all of the things that I did wrong. I will give you all of my secrets. Um, I will help you like everyone else helped me. Um, and I really have to thank the community, so many OFO members, so many other birders in my area. Uh, I owe them so much. All of the other big year birders, they were so kind to me and so helpful. 
um, and my wife and family for putting up with my insanity for an entire year, <laughs> not not making me feel guilty about leaving at a moment's notice for a day or two. Um, so yeah, thanks so much for for joining me. Wow. <laughs> Right, that's really and this is this is the condensed version i have i have photos of almost every single species and video and i would love to share it with everybody but uh oh okay i'm totally inspired but i think if i was going to do that i have to move well you know honestly i don't think you have to do an ontario big year just do a, a your local circle yeah, my local like I, I, I have aspirations to just do a Wellington County big year now. Yeah, um, that's so cool. Thank you so much, Brad. Well, thank that you. Was, that was awesome. Does anyone have questions? Did you did we figure out about the socks? The socks. I don't have. I I will get those to Jeff. Yeah, maybe I'd like to know too. <laughs> it, I, I bought the ones that the brand that I bought, I don't think it's really a brand thing as much as like, if you can just find battery heated socks, I, I kid you not. They are like, I don't know what I was doing in life before heated socks because they are re a revelation of winter, anything. They are amazing. Uh, question about Mets. Yes. So Metz is an area, so it's a it's a geographic location. It is near Arthur. And if you Google it, um, I think it comes, if you type in Metz, Ontario, it'll come up. So it's just an area. So it's a bunch of fields with a bunch of old barns. And the snowy owls go there every year. There's no like one particular, like I don't mind telling people because you can't really harass them unless you want to do something stupid like walk in knee deep snow out into a farmer's field. Um, they'll just fly anyway, um, but they're always there. So Mets, Mets, and then there's a a recycling center, a composting center that usually has Glacus gall and a few other sort of interesting galls as well in the area. And you almost, you're almost guaranteed to see rough-legged hawk and I've seen Lapland Longspur up there, snow buntings. Like it's a really cool like winter burning spot. And um, I do believe that people run tours. I think Ofo has done a tour up there before. Some of the, maybe it's Hamilton burning. Like there's, there's some of the burning groups do run, like they'll take like six or seven cars and they'll split up and then they'll radio each other. And so. So uh, we're wondering about the routes you took. Like, did you, so, Sarah so, was asking about that, yeah. Yeah, so my, my plan is to always try to take a secondary road. Um, and that worked out for most of the year um, until I started to get tired. And then I would do things like, oh, I'll just take Highway 9 um, to save some time. So the third bike ended up becoming the third bike because on my ride to uh, here on Fringe and McGregor, I took Highway 9 and it was raining and I was on my road bike. So it has very skinny tires. And there was a very... It was a relatively short section of road, but very narrow, no shoulder. Uh, and a fuel truck passed me and there was oncoming traffic and it drifted into the shoulder. Um, and I saw it in just enough time to squeeze my brakes, just enough to pop out the back before it smushed me. Um, and the reason if I had if I had hit the shoulder with the road bike, I would have crashed and probably gone under the wheels. So I bought. I bought the gravel bike so that I had more safety to get off the road. Um, so that was dumb. That was, that was probably the dumbest route that I took. Um, riding a bike on the Queensway and not realizing there's a bike path on the other side of the road is also dumb. You get hit by cars. Um, so mostly, mostly back roads. Um, there's, 
like there's a few a few trips that I didn't do because of roads and traffic. So the glossy ibis that was hanging out at Darlington. Um it was just it's too crazy, like going over the top of Toronto and it's just I I didn't feel comfortable. It's just not it's not safe. It's not fun. And like I don't think my kids want to write die chasing birds <laughs> on my headstone. So there's a few that I I I chose not to go after. Um like the the marsh sandpiper. I decided not to do the marsh sandpiper because it would have been dangerous to ride from there to Rondo. It's uh I, I think I recognized some rail trail in there. Yeah, so I did when I did the buff breasted sandpiper in the sod farm, which is which is close to Barry. I had the gravel bike and, and, oh, well, actually the rail trail down. So from here to long point, there's rail trail and like a bike, a bike path. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. So you can do most of from Guelph to the lake on completely secluded, non, no cars kind of stuff. So I, I did try to prioritize that as much as possible. And when I had the gravel bike, then I started taking a lot more rail trails. So I, the, the trip to the Buff Breast of Sandpiper was like 140k return, and that was all rail trail, which was amazing. Harder riding, though, a little bit. What's that? Be harder riding a little bit. It, yeah, so that that's the trade off, which is you're way safer, but it's slower. the The riding is actually easier because the rail trails are typically quite flat. Um but it's slower. It's probably a good five kilometers an hour slower. Thanks everyone who's who's giving me accolades for the presentation. Yeah. Well, that, that was outstanding. And, and thank you one more time for coming and thank you everybody else for uh, joining us this evening. Yeah, thanks. Thanks everyone for coming and, and staying as long as you did. I, I tried to make it shorter, but I didn't succeed. Um, again, if if you have any questions or you're thinking about doing something crazy, let me know and uh, I'll help you out as much as I can. I think we were all perched on the edges of our seats looking at the pictures and stuff. So yeah, so I think I will bid everybody a good night. Go birding, ride your bike, take your kayak, whatever you got. Yes. And uh, we'll see you November 1st, and we'll talk about Rainy River. Yeah. Thanks, nice. Brett. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um... Thank you, Jeff. I mean, I, I had a whole...